The Wimbledon finals are all set, and here we are. It is the big moment that everyone knew was coming. Novak Djokovic is going for number 20 in his way. Big Italian. Of course, we got the S San Pellegrino sparkling Italian mineral water out to celebrate Italians, as we're so fond of doing here at Coffee Break Tennis. Uh, Matteo Berrettini is the only thing that stands in the way of Novak Djokovic, equaling his biggest rivals, the two guys that no one uh, ever thought would be equaled for, for a long, long time. I'd say only about five years ago in 2016, the last time everyone thought that Novak was about to win the Grand Slam, the first time since, uh, I think, 1969 was when Rod Laver did it for the second time. Amazing. Uh, we've been waiting. You know, we heard Roger was going to do it years ago. We heard, uh, well, we never really heard Rafa would do it too much, but we used to hear it all the time that Roger was going to do it in, in his peak years. But it's been quiet on Novak since 2016 because of the way 2016 went down, uh, largely because of Stan Wawrinka, you could blame for spoiling that. And now, five years later, it looks like Djokovic is actually going to do it. Uh, I think Novak was asked a, a very good question. You know, uh, recent history, we've seen some horrible questions in the press conferences at ATP uh, tournaments. Take a listen to this one. Uh, I think his name's Tumani Carroll from The Guardian. Uh, this was a good question, and I think it highlights one thing that stands out that makes Novak Djokovic different from Roger and Rafa. Take a listen. You're obviously well known for play playing your best tennis on important points and important moments. I was wondering, like, what, when did that you feel that became an asset for you uh, in your career? I guess was was that from 2011 or earlier? You know, something you were born with? I don't know. I don't think you're born with it. I think that it comes with. Um with time, with the experience, with um, mental and physical and work, uh, obviously, and the, the the more matches you play and the the more times you're in these similar situations, the the more confident or more comfortable, I would say, you feel every next time you get to face these particular circumstances where you're you know, break point down or you know, playing in Grand Slam final stages against top rivals. And yeah, so I think that experience definitely uh, favors me every single time. I Next time I get to walk onto the court and, and uh, knowing that I've been through everything that I could possibly go through as a tennis player. Um, and I know my strengths. I, um, I know what, what I'm capable of, and I rely on that. I don't think I was born with it, says Novak Djokovic. Interesting, he said, what, did it come to you in 2011? Uh, how do you get to such a place where you're ready to be so clutch in all of the clutch moments? I mean, everyone in the world knew that Shapovalov was not going to win today. And it's almost like when he took a lead, he took that break, holding serve pretty easy, Shapovalov, in that first set. I almost felt like when he took the lead, it was like more of a sign that he was going to lose rather than seeing him go down. That sounds crazy, but I think if you've been watching tennis as closely as I have the last few years, I think you know what I mean. Uh, Shapovalov, he takes that lead in the break, and then of course you know when he serves it out for the first set, there is just no chance that Djokovic is going to let him win that game. Uh and that's why I like this this answer from Djokovic, this question, because uh, there is something that he's been through that Rafa and Roger haven't been through. All right, let me, let me read exactly uh, so I remember exactly what it was that he said here before I make my point on this. Uh, the more matches you play, the more times you are in similar situations, the more comfortable you feel every next time you face these very difficult circumstances, like break points down or like being in the finals against one of your biggest rivals at a Grand Slam. Here we go. The experience, says Novak Djokovic, world number one and possibly greatest of all time tennis player. It's it, it's uh, it's very near. Near. Can he do it? Can he close it out? Right. It's time to. We saw Shapo couldn't close out that first set. It's time to see can Djokovic close it out? Can he equal? And then can he get a couple more to seal the deal? Greatest of all time, possibly. Novak says experience favors me a little more every time I walk on the court, knowing. That I've been, here's the main point for me, I've been through every single thing that you possibly can go through as a tennis player. I know my strengths. I rely on them. It's not a guarantee you'll always find a way, but at least you can rely on the things that you know 
work for you. So when I first heard that, you know, you might think, Roger and Rafa, they've been through everything that a tennis player can go through as well. And I think they have. But they haven't quite gone through what Novak has, and that's having, as he said himself, I, I, it wasn't that long ago, someone said, uh, what are you talking about, Matt? Uh, you know, like I was crazy for saying that uh, Djokovic has the crowd against him almost everywhere he goes around the world, no matter where he's playing, right? 90% of the time, says Novak Djokovic, the crowd is against him. And that, I don't think... I, I can't think of a, I'm sure it's happened some, you know, maybe in Davis Cup or something like that, but I can't re recall any moments where Roger or Rafa had 90% of the crowd against them, and you definitely can't say they face circumstances like that 90% of the time. Uh, one of my original points doing Coffee Break Tennis years ago was saying my Novak Djokovic theorem is that having that much support against you, right, people cheering that hard for you to fail has to hurt Djokovic mentally at some point and wreck him, make him uh, make it so he can't go on. And the opposite has been true. Uh, true, It's made him the strongest mentally in the world. And now it is time for Novak Djokovic to prove that. Now, the funny thing is, there was some good stuff. Uh, you know, like, uh, let, let's, let's listen to this really quick. Uh, well, I'm not going to play it for you. I'll just read it. Shapovalov said, I think what hurt this time, because he, he was crying when he left the court, which is probably a good sign for uh, Shapo's future. I, I, it reminds me of a, a documentary I watched uh, a, a long time ago about McEnroe, and uh, I can't remember the guy who said this, but he he, uh, he might have been a referee or something like that, you know, a, line, a lines guy. He said he saw McEnroe after losing a junior tournament just crying and crying, and he thought to himself like, wow, this, this kid really takes it pretty serious. Uh, I bet if he cares this much about losing a tennis match, he's probably going to get pretty good if he if he cares this much about tennis. And it turned out that uh, McEnroe would win seven slams. So probably a good uh, good sign to see Shapo caring that much. And as Novak said himself in the presser, he told Shapo, like, just hang in there, buddy. Stay focused. You're going to have more chances to close one of these things out, which is uh, kind of incredible to, to hear Novak said, uh, you know, a rival that might be a thorn in his side in a couple of years. Who knows? Shapo might be giving uh, Djokovic a harder time in the next couple of years. What hurt this time is I feel like the game is there. I felt that it was possible to win the trophy. It's a feeling I've never felt. These guys are coming. The young guys are coming. And and the belief is really all that matters when you have uh, these kind of shots. Or, you know, we see we see how good Shapovalov is, the shot making. Uh, Djokovic was asked about how his development looks to him, and he says, you know, even just a year ago, Shapovalov is making a lot less unforced errors. He's really cleaning it up. Take a look at this graphic. This was in the Kachanov match, and you can see how Shapovalov is making less and less unforced errors as the match progresses on. But I was really struck by that. It's a feeling I've never felt. I felt from the back like I was outplaying Novak, and uh, and he was outplaying Novak in, in a, from the back, from the baseline, in a lot of the rallies, but Novak, of course, was the best in the clutch moments where, where he talked about in that first quote that I, I read to you or I played a clip for you at the beginning of this intro. Anyways, here's another great question uh, to Novak Djokovic. Oh, and really quick, play this. If, if anyone out there still thinks that Djokovic is not an overall pretty nice guy, uh, take a listen to this. Djokovic wanted to make sure the Italian Ubaldo in, uh, in the, the press pool that he would get a chance to ask a question. You'll, you'll take a listen. Last English question, Eleanor Crooks. And Ubaldo, Ubaldo, and also Ubaldo Italian. Uh, he, he wants, he, I see him there. He's, he's begging to have a question. One short question for because it's Italy. You know, they got the big Sunday ahead of them. They're cutting off the, the questions, but Djokovic made sure the Italian journalist, who has a good website, uh, Ubi Tennis is a good tennis news site, he made sure that the guy got his question in. And uh, I love this question. It's a great question. He basically says, Berrettini, <laughs> just, I'll play it for you. Take a listen. It's pretty funny, actually. Ubaldo, please keep your question short. Okay, I will. Uh, Ubaldo Scanagata, Sport Club Serbia TV. Uh, 30, yes, uh, Volim Serbsky Jezik. Uh, 30 slams finals, not too bad. Berrettini will play his first uh, slam finals. I want to know 
What do you remember of your first uh, uh, slam final? Ubaldo, it was 15 years ago almost, my friend. 2007 in uh, New York. I, I lost, uh, I think, uh, three tough tie breaks to, to Roger. And uh, yeah, I remember that uh, I was just so thrilled to be in the finals. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I was close. I had a good match against Roger, but I just probably you know, did not maybe uh, believe enough, I, I guess, in the victory at a, at a certain moments when when uh, the score line was um, was close. Uh, yeah, I mean, it really depends. We're all different, you know, for Matteo, I think, he, you know, for me, I, I played uh, first Grand Slam finals, uh, I was really young, uh, was 20 or 20 years old. Uh, Matteo is, is a bit older. He's he's had more experience playing on the tour. He's already had um, notable results on, on the biggest tournaments in our sport and some big wins against the top players of the world. So it's it's a different situation, so to say, you know, but I expect him to be on really high level because that's what he's been delivering in the last couple of weeks. I love how they have to tell Ubaldo to, to keep it short in the beginning. Uh, not too bad. 30 Grand Slam finals. Berrettini is in his first. And, of course, he asked Djokovic, uh, as you just heard, do you remember your first? And as soon as I heard that question, uh, my mind went to 2007 U.S. Open final right away. I remember it very well because as a big Fed fan, uh, you know, we saw that Djokovic was kind of tough. You know, he, he gave up. Uh, Federer a closer match than most upcoming young talents did back then in 2007 at the Australian Open. It was straight sets. Roger beats uh, Djokovic in straight sets in 2007 AO Australian Open. But I remember feeling like, whoa, this guy, he actually, you know, you, you watch Federer and you just, you never believe anyone can beat him. And something felt a little different in that match. And even though Roger was able to come through in straight sets, like Djokovic said, uh, it was a pretty good final. He gave him a good fight. But specifically, he points out, you know, it it's really depends because we are all different. I was really young at 20 years old. Mateo's a bit older, more experienced playing on the tour. He's had multiple results on the biggest stages of our tour and wins over big names. I expect him to be on a very high level. That's what he's been delivering the last few weeks. He also said that uh, Berrettini is the informed player on grass this year. He is... He's undefeated on grass this year. I think Berrettini has won, uh, I think he's won like 11 matches straight, 10 or 11 matches straight on grass, something like that, because he won at Queens Club. But I think that is very interesting to point out because this is a lot different. A lot of this is because young guys don't break through anymore, really, right? Since uh, Djokovic and Nadal, you don't see young guys making the finals of majors, and you have to go way back to that time. Uh 2004 for Rafa, 2007, as, uh, as you know, from Djokovic. Mateo is 25 years old, and I think that that experience uh, might might play a, a, a role tomorrow. It might make a difference, but of course, you know, I'm going to pick Djokovic to win tomorrow. The whole world is going to pick Djokovic to win tomorrow. Uh, but we've never seen Djokovic serve out a match to tie Roger and Rafa to truly be their equals. No one can say that he's he falls short of them after this. You know, you, 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 it'll be hard not to say that Djokovic isn't the GOAT if he can win on Sunday, and, and I really do think he will. So it is a big ask of Novak Djokovic. How is he going to feel when he steps up to the line? How is the crowd? That was another thing. They asked, you know, how do you feel having home support on Sunday? And Djokovic said, well, I don't know if it's going to be home support, but hopefully I'll have more support. To be honest, I'm not sure. I won't be surprised at all if the crowd goes more for Berrettini to win than Djokovic. And I'm not talking Djokovic is up two sets of love and they want to see more tennis. They might really pull for Berrettini to win it rather than Djokovic. How he's going? How is he going to deal with that? I, I don't know. That's why we got to see on Sunday when Djokovic goes to equal his two great rivals that most people not only didn't think he would ever equal, but desperately didn't want him to equal. So this is the most incredible sports story, I think, in the history of sport, or at least in my lifetime of seeing sport. And uh, it's must-see TV. We're going to find out on Sunday. And, of course, there'll be a little bit more, but it does feel like Roger and Rafa are not in a position like Novak for the next few years to keep winning these things. Of course, I'm always going to support my guy. I make a show of my Roger Federer support. He is my guy and always will be my guy, but I have much love and much respect. Right? We got the Rafa hat out here because he sadly couldn't be at Wimbledon. Much love and much respect for all three including Novak Djokovic, 
We head to the finals at Wimbledon, and all I say is, may the best man win. <clears throat> Welcome to Coffee Break Tennis. Today on the show, we have some stats to go through because, you know, a lot of the experts out there, former uh, legends of the game, they thought Chapo was the, the best bet. Maybe uh, maybe I'm being unfair. Maybe that was mostly saying in the top half of the draw, Chapo was the best most dangerous threat to take down Djokovic. But regardless of what anyone thinks, I've got the stats to say that Berrettini is definitely, as Djokovic said, the informed player on grass and reason to believe that he is more dangerous than El Chapo. So we'll look through some numbers that I think uh, are pretty important numbers. Uh, on top of that, you got to see the way Berrettini is placing his ball. It's one thing to hit the serve as big as Berrettini. But to get the high first serve in percentage and to hit the spots like Berrettini, we will take a look at the spot hitting graph of Matteo Berrettini because that is scary. Also, Hoopy Hercatch is eating way too many bananas. Way too many bananas. I would put that up there. Uh, I will not lie. We will have to talk about Roger Federer's loss on the show. It was very hard on me. Roger's been a, a hero of mine. My um, my entire adult life, you know, I started watching tennis as an 18 year old, and uh, you know, Roger's been uh, been my guy for a long time. So it was very hard to watch him lose the way he did. But we'll talk about what it means, and we'll read a lot of uh, what experts out there are saying, what they think about whether this is the end for Roger or if he actually could keep going. Uh, spoiler alert: I think and hope he does keep going, and I think he'll have another shot. But it's probably just one and with Djokovic around and a lot of very dangerous young guys who are getting better all the time. Uh, it's very unlikely we see Roger Federer win another major. But of course, I will give him one more chance next year at Wimbledon, maybe the Australian Open as well. Uh, yeah, that's about it on the show. But let's take a look at the Twitter poll. I put this up on the Twitters. Uh, what do you think? Does Berrettini have 10% chance of winning on Sunday? 20% chance? More or zero? Absolutely no chance. Uh, it's kind of split on 10 and 20. What's the difference there? Uh, more, 24% people think is a greater chance that Berrettini wins. And then the biggest number of all uh, out of these four responses, 26% say zero chance. So more than 75% of the electorate here on the Twitter tennis poll, they think that Berrettini has somewhere between 0% and 20% chance of upsetting the great, possibly greatest ever, Novak Djokovic. Plus, take a look at Mr. Goat. He's been pulling for Djokovic for years now. We don't talk about it a lot in here. It's something me and Mr. Goat uh, do not agree on. Although, you know, who cares what I think anymore because it looks like Mr. Goat is going to be right about who will be Goat. Yes, the cat has always loved Djokovic a little bit more than Roger and Rafa. Um... Let's take a look at the stats. Let's go right into the stats. We'll talk about Roger last because uh, you know, I, I really didn't want to uh, make a show after seeing uh, Roger lose like that. It was uh, really hard. But there was a great comment uh, on, on my Patreon page uh, from one of the patron saints. You can join them at patreon.com forward slash coffee break tennis if you love the show and want to see me keep going. Uh, this is a, a, a hard time to do it after seeing the way Roger lost, but um, I'll read it to you later. There's a great comment from one of the patron saints talking about Roger's loss, putting it all in perspective, and uh, I thought it was very nice of him to write that. Uh, his name is Elad, Elad Liebman, which stands for lover man in German, I think. I think, something like that. Uh, anyways, uh, let's take a look at these numbers put on the screen. Novak Djokovic over El Chapo. 81%. Uh, you know, Chapo, as Djokovic said, is one of the best servers in the game now, especially as a lefty, especially at Wimbledon. 79% win on first serve. That's a good number against Novak Djokovic, the greatest returner of all time. What was scary here for Fed fans and people that wanted to see Djokovic lose or just didn't want to see him take uh, the GOAT record and just see him lose for that, no, nothing other than that. Uh, seeing Djokovic serve the way he has served, you really didn't feel like it was possible. Deep down, I wanted to be so optim optimistic about Rogers' run at Wimbledon. I never thought he'd lose to Hubie. I really, that was shocking. Uh, I did think he would probably lose to Berrettini, but I was going to give him a shot if he was able to just get 
get it rolling, you know, keep feeling better and better. If he had a great match against Hubi, I was going to take him to beat Berrettini. If he barely survived and was looking vulnerable, I was going to go back to where I felt at the draw show that Berrettini is probably the one who's just too hot for Roger with so few matches coming in. But Djokovic, I knew if he served like this, 81% win on first serve. I know uh, Shapo, he's much better at returning on grass than uh, Sitsipas, but, you know, he's not... His strength is def- definitely serving. He's no Novak Djokovic on return, but seeing Djokovic put up numbers like this, 81% win on first, it was hard to imagine Roger beating him here. Uh, second serve, 57 win on second for Djokovic. Such a great job defending second serve compared to 42 from Shap, Shap Adap, El Shapo. Uh, out aced Shapo. I mean, what do you do with Djokovic when he's serving like this? This is, this is a guy who's really uh, made himself the best. Right? He, he definitely wasn't born with it. The way he went to work on making his game the best in the world. The best of all time, maybe. And, and you got to give him credit. You know, the, the strength of the return plus what he's done with his serve, it really is incredible. There's not many players in history you can think of who are so good at serving and returning. Uh, the winners to unforced errors. And this is where I see a lot of promise for Berrettini actually having a realistic shot at winning or just doing better. You know, he'll come closer to beating Djokovic than anyone else has at Wimbledon. I think he will do better than Shapo did. And here's why. Djokovic, 33 winners on 15 unforced errors. Out hit from the back of the court with winners, for, as Shapo said, 40. But look at 36 unforced errors. Now, I'm just going to read to you Berrettini's winners and unforced errors. Yes, it's not against Djokovic, but, you know, her catch is, uh, for his size, moves very, very well. He's kind of like a big cat, which is why uh, Mr. Goat likes him more than um, those reporters in Monte Carlo. Uh, <laughs> play that clip for you later if you haven't seen that. Pretty amazing. Uh, 60 winners from Berrettini on 18 unforced errors. Uh, he's just way less, you know, Djokovic said, Shap was making less unforced errors than before, but Berrettini has been so clean on grass this year. And I feel like he'll be able to survive in a rally longer. So 18 unforced errors, that's half of what Shapo had. 60 winners compared to 40, so he's hitting 33.3333333% more winners than Shapo and making half of the unforced errors. I mean, that is so clean. Hubi was only able to put up 27 winners on 26 unforced errors. Uh, if, if Berrettini <clears throat> cannot have that number totally wrecked by Djokovic, he will have a chance... And uh, I think Berrettini, his ability to uh, to hang in a rally with that slice backhand, it, it's very nice here. I think that'll be a factor, too. Uh, his slice, we knew it was good in 2019 watching Berrettini. We, we sang his praises. But uh, he's even better this time around. And definitely, uh, as of the, the case with Shapo, if he doesn't win it, he's going to have more opportunities to do it in the future at 25 years of age. But back to the Djokovic stats. A very telling one here, which goes to show you why Djokovic, you know, he says he's why he's able to feel so comfortable in the situations of major massive pressure. One for 11 breakpoint opportunities converted for Shapo. Djokovic only three out of 10, one less chance than Shapo had. But that that makes all the difference in the world. That's all he needed to win this thing in straight sets at the net. Shapo uh, came to net more often, but he only won 77 percent, 30 out of 39 the Joker, 85% win at the net, 28 out of 33 trips to the net. I mean, Joker has really put the full package together in the last years. Uh, his, his game is uh, it, it's in, impenetrable now. You know, these were the things in the past where you'd say, like, well, this is where Roger can make some inroads against Djokovic. But 85% win at net, 81% win on first serve, 57% win on second serve, out acing someone like Shapovalov. We all know the return skills of Djokovic. Like, how are you going to beat him? Well, looking at Berrettini and uh, Hubi Hercatch, 22 aces. Take a look at this. This is what Berrettini has done in every single match. 20 aces in all of his three first-round matches, each seven against Avashka. That's the outlier here. 12 against Felix. 21. Felix is a a supreme athlete, so maybe that helped him get the, the stick on the ball a little bit more. Maybe some more service winners there. I'd like to see that number. 21, his biggest number yet on Hubi. Wait, that says 21. Oh, okay, that graph was before he hit one more ace. So 22 total, his biggest number on one double fault. Right, Shapo, I actually don't see his number here. I don't know how many double faults he has. I don't have it on my screen. Maybe you have it on yours. But uh, t- 
to throw down 22 aces and with only one double fault, this guy is supremely confident right now. That's why you got to give him more than a puncher's chance, as uh, many experts out there were saying for Chapo. But take a look at this. This is number one to me. This is what, when I see Federer with a graph like this, I get full of confidence knowing that Federer can take down almost anyone. Anyone except Djokovic, maybe, when he's returning at his best. But Federer doesn't serve near, nearly as hard as Berrettini nowadays. Look at what Berrettini is doing with his giant serve. In the ad court, 75% of the time he's hitting those corners. There are no serves at the body, right? He's going for aces all the time, hunting for aces. In the deuce court, he's even better. 83% of the time he is nailing the corners in that goat zone, that green area. Uh, like I said, no serves at the body whatsoever. And again, Hubi eating at least four bananas. My God. Here's another stat for you to think maybe he's going to have a shot at beating Djokovic. He's going to have to hold serve rock solid. You could see a first set, just like with Shapovalov, where uh, you know maybe Djokovic is a little bit off early on. He kind of he kind of gave a game away. He gave a break to Shapo, you could say. You know, he's feeling the pressure of Shapo hitting so hard. And uh, maybe there was a little bit of nerves coming out there against someone who's going to swing as freely and as big as Shapovalov did. If you have something like that with Berrett Berrettini, uh, Djokovic might find himself down 5-4, right? Berrettini might get a shot just like Shapo to serve for the first set. I think he's going to be able to do it because of this. Take a look. He'll be better equipped to hold serve in that all-important uh, all game. Uh, I think he's a little more mature. He's a little bit older. You know, Djokovic said he's older than he was in his first final. Well, he's also older than Shapovalov, too, and a little more mature. 87% uh, of the time, this is, rem let me remind you here, this is not first serves. Usually we see this graph, this statistic, we see it with Rafa a lot. They show it a lot during clay court season. Uh, we see it just based on first serve alone. This is first and second. Doesn't matter if Berrettini is hitting a second serve. Almost 90%, 87% of the time, He's finding a forehand, and his forehand, it just looks, you know, I was uh, listening to uh, Craig O'Shaughnessy lecture not that long ago, and I remember one of the things he was stressing to tennis coaches like myself when you work with younger players is to, you know, don't obsess over how beautiful your forehand stroke looks, right? You don't have to make it look just like Roger. You just have to make it easy to reproduce. I'm not saying Berrettini's forehand is like ugly or something. But Berrettini, to me, looks like a guy who's not going to have trouble knocking that forehand down for several hours in a row with, without much deviation from the plan, right? I don't think it's going to falter very much. Berrettini's not going to fall apart there. So Djokovic, greatest returner of all time. He will take that number down. 87% finding a forehand off the return of serve, you know, off of your big first and second in the case of Berrettini. It won't be that high, but it's still going to be a very good number. He's going to be more capable of doing this than anyone anyone that Djokovic has faced. You know, you think of someone like a Sasha Zverev who can play big enough to take out Djokovic. We saw it at the World Tour Finals. feels like forever ago, but it was, uh, you know, surprising. Kind of took the racket out of Djokovic's hands. I almost want to say at this point, you trust Berrettini more, especially the way we saw Zverev go out with like 20, 20, 22, you know, as many aces as Berrettini had. I think it was 22 double faults from Sasha Zverev. So this is a guy who will be able to ask the questions and put the pressure on Djokovic. So there's more than just Djokovic playing for greatest of all time here. Uh, we also have the fact that I think Berrettini is going to be able to make it a little tougher. And on grass, even though it's the slowest grass in history, uh, it, it's going to be tough. You saw the Twitter poll, though. Everyone thinks Djokovic is going to win. So with that, I come up with a prediction here. This is tough to say. But I will say Djokovic does win. Part of me wants to say we get a five-set epic, which would be nice for the last uh, the last match at Wimbledon. You know, finals are always more fun when they're five-setters because, you know, there's so much mystery and intrigue. You don't know what's going to happen. But I, I strongly want to go with Djokovic in four sets, even though Berrettini has everything he needs, you know, everything anyone could ask to have. Uh, ultimately, you know, he's got all the weapons, but ultimately I go with what Djokovic said he, you know, he noted in his first final, in the close moments, he just didn't believe enough that he could beat Federer back in 2007. Berrettini's more mature. He's 25, you know, he's five years older than Djokovic was. That that will make a difference. I think that's, as Djokovic pointed out, 
that's going to help Berrettini. But ultimately, does he believe, just like Tsitsipas we saw, didn't believe. He's up two sets to love. Deep down, he didn't believe that he was going to take out the great champion, especially seeing what uh, what happened with uh, Lorenzo Musetti, another sparkling Italian. So I'm going to go with Djokovic in four because ultimately when Berrettini, you know, in the first set, I could see him doing it. 5-4, he gets that early break, and uh, he, he holds the nerve, holds the uh, serve to win the set. I could see that, but I don't know if he's going to be able to do it as they get deeper in the match when he really starts thinking, I might win this thing. Uh, you know, just like when they asked him how he was feeling, you know, he, he, he seemed to feel like he couldn't believe he was going to a slam final. Uh, it is, it's a tough ask. We just saw it at the French Open. Why would Djokovic not be able to do it again? And Tsitsipas, you know, talk about Berrettini having a, a lot of experience already. Tsitsipas, uh, he has more experience than uh, Berrettini, you could say. All right, let's move to uh, what I really didn't want to do the last couple days. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. But let me find uh, what Elad said on patreon.com forward slash copy break tennis. Let me read that for you first, especially, especially if you're like me and you're, uh, you're still hurting out there. You're a big Fed fan and you're, you're still hurting. Put this one on the screen. This is from Elad Liebman, a uh, beloved patron saint. God bless the patron saints. I see a lot of mourning among my fellow Fed fans, and I'm not sure I fully get it. Realistically, given how he looked coming into Wimbledon, a quarterfinal is a pretty solid result. Would have been nice to have lost in less lost in uh, less one-sided fashion against Hubie Hercatch. Rhymes with Latch. But you could see that physically, Federer just wasn't there. Given how poor the preparation was, that's to be expected. I remember that once, after a truly dreadful loss to a lesser opponent, the legendary Manchester United manager Alex Ferguson said, In the history of Manchester United, this is another day and we will recover. Now, I don't know what recovery means for a 40-year-old Fed coming back from 18 months out of the game and two knee surgeries, but I know this. He's not gone through a very difficult rehab for this loss to be his final moment in tennis. This was just another day in the long and proud and sometimes painful history of tennis legend Roger Federer. Federer could have pulled a Sampras and retired in 2012. And let me point out, a lot of people at the time thought he might do that. But he chose to stick around for a decade longer, suffering many heartbreaking losses, but also amazing successes. Reminder. Federer, in his 30s, has won more slams than Andy Murray, Stan Wawrinka, and Gustavo Curtin in their entire careers. And they're all Hall of Famers. While time waits for no man, and the end is drawing nearer with every passing year, I don't think he's done quite yet. And even if he were, and days like the one he had yesterday became more frequent and the good days become more rare, I'm going to stick by him. And I'm at peace with whatever results he can achieve so long as he's willing to put in the work and compete. What Fed is doing takes real courage, real dignity, and I respect it too much to feel sad for him or for myself as a fan by proxy. Uh, beautiful. Really, really well said. Um, I don't think I can say, you know, let's end the show right there because I can't say much more. But, you know, I, I feel that. I'm not embarrassed for Roger. You know, there, you see people on Twitter. They're probably very young and haven't been following tennis too long, but you know they kind of want to throw Roger under the bus when he doesn't get the win they expect out of him. I do think Roger will be back, but you know, just like in 2016, seeing him slip and fall to Milos Raonic really hurt. And this one, just knowing that 40 is a number that you know no one's no one wins in tennis at 40. And Jimmy Connors, he kept playing into his 40s, but he kind of turned into a minor league player towards the end of his career. Roger's definitely not going to do that. But uh, I think uh, that that's really well put, and I do expect Roger to come back. And I'll add one more thing to that. It's not just that Roger didn't go through the painful rehab and all that with the knees. Uh, he didn't go through all that to come back and lose like this and never try again. I also I don't think Roger's going to make his last Wimbledon a bagel set to Hubi, the banana eater. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Years Five years later, it's because, you know, five years ago was when Djokovic kind of had things fall apart. But it was also when uh, Roger, when everyone thought he really was done for real. You know, they thought he was done back in 2012. In 2013, uh, they thought he was done for sure when he started having the the more severe back issues that he was able to overcome. And he started experimenting with the larger racket size, going from, uh, you know, this 90-inch racket that he played with his entire career. And then he switched to, well, first he went to the... Actually, he had an all-black test racket. And then he went to this red and black one. You'll remember that from the years that... uh. Was I guess 2015? 
he had that one. 2014, he still had like an all black. And of course, now he's got this uh, all black one that uh, that I use that I love so much. But yeah, so it was five years ago. I remember hating Milos Raonic after that. Hating him. And I'm kind of, you know, Hubie's such a nice guy. Uh, if you're feeling like me and now you hate Hubie Hercatch and you really, you enjoyed seeing him eat the bagel that he uh, had just dished out the round before, uh, take a look at this. This is from Monte Carlo. This was uh, Hubie Hercatch having no questions in a press conference. Maybe you'll feel a little bad for him and not hate him so much. Please talk. Please raise your hand. Any questions in English? No. Okay, we'll switch to Polish. Any questions? No. <laughs> no I mean, you were requested. <laughs> You're better. No question. That's okay. nice. Nice press no conference. Okay. okay. I'm smiling a little, but it's it, it's hard to like laugh at that. It, it's funny some of the stuff he said, but that that had to have hurt him pretty bad deep down. Uh, anyways, um, let's move on to uh, what people around the world are saying about Federer. And then maybe I'll share a couple more of my thoughts. And then maybe we'll do some German idioms. <laughs> uh, this is from uh, Mats Wielander, Eurosport reporting here. Her catch was just too good today. Federer is obviously not at his best at the moment. And I'll point that out. He looked, you know, I always say Federer's movement. If it's still there, he can still win against anyone, including Djokovic, especially on faster and lower bouncing courts. He, he looked slow. He, he really did. Maybe he looked like it a little bit in early rounds occasionally, but overall I thought he was moving pretty well. But he wasn't really pressured the way Hercatch was able to bring it to him, right? Hercatch has the ability to step in like the Tomas Birdman Burdich, hit the flat ball very aggressively. Uh, you know, no one put the pressure. You know, Federer looks really good moving around when he's attacking you. But when you put more pressure on him, and it was very windy too, you get a... Those were, as McEnroe said, the toughest conditions we'd seen the entire fortnight of Wimbledon. Uh, it, it was unfortunate that when Federer came out, there was a very tricky, windy conditions. So that made that made it even harder. Federer said it himself. It makes the footwork more difficult to get it just right to keep attacking the way he needed to. So that that was part of it also. But I think Roger wasn't able. He wasn't ready. Right. He played eight matches the entire year, and almost all of them, most of them, five of them, and yeah, three at the French Open were best of three sets. The three at the French Open were best of five. I don't think Roger was ready to play five matches best of five sets. Even at Wimbledon, where it's a little softer and easier on the body, I just don't think his body was ready to handle it, and that's the only thing I can say explaining why. He said it himself. He said, uh, you know, his presser that, you know, the first question they asked him was, Roger, are you going to retire, basically? Or they said, is this the last time we'll see you at Wimbledon? He said, um, you know, I don't know. But that's only because, you know, a lot of media ran with that saying, oh, Roger doesn't know if he'll be back. Retirement on the cards coming soon. But really, he said, well, I don't know, because at my age, I could get another injury in a month, tomorrow. Who knows? I might not, you know, sometime between now and a year from now at next year's Wimbledon, so many different things could happen that keep me from being able to physically even do it. But then he went on to say, and I got to get with the team. And he said, we got to figure out, you know, what I need to do to, to be moving better, to get, you know, get my speed back. He said something like that. So that's encouraging to, to hear him think that he's going to be able to get a higher level of fitness and I think, you know, considering all the circumstances around Roger coming in this year, there's no reason to think, you know, I know 40 is a very scary number for tennis players, but 39, it's not that different. There's no reason to not think that he couldn't be a fitter 40 with a year of being healthy and not having the surgeries and all that, having more time to play matches and train. There's no reason not to say that Roger could be moving better, lasting longer, possibly. Well, I'll read you some of the experts in a second talking about what that's like. Darren Cahill's shared his experiences coaching Agassi for the last years of his career. But it's possible. It's possible that Roger could overall physically be better at 40 at Wimbledon next year than he was this year with uh, all the circumstances surrounding his comeback and everything. All right. Federer is obviously not at his best at the moment, says Mats Wielander. But her catch just made him look ordinary for once. He is really, really a good tennis player. Uh, when you have a lack of matches, you can have a bit of a lack of confidence. When your forehand's not working... It's not easy to fall back on the rest of your game when your number one strength is not working perfectly. The intimidation factor is starting to fade with Federer, as it does for everyone. But more than anything, Hercatch played an unbelievably solid game, and he deserved to win. He handled the nerves extremely well. Uh, Boris Becker said uh, pretty much the same thing, but then he, um, 
You know, he said, I, I don't think, you know, Roger will admit if there's some kind of little injury stuff going on with him. But honestly, I don't know if we will ever see the great man here again. From Boris Becker, uh, John McEnroe said, I can't believe it. it. I can't believe what's just happened. But, you know, he is human. He is Roger Federer. And uh, Matt Vilander said, all credit to him for that. There are certain rules even Roger has to obey in its matches. If you don't get, you don't get it in practice. You only find out how good you are when you put yourself in that position. And today... He just wasn't good enough. Thanks a lot, Matthew Lander. You know, that's good analysis for Matthew Lander. It's nothing wrong with all that. Uh, okay, so let's move on to uh, a lot of... Uh, and I will say one thing about Hubie Hercatch. Um, take a look at this stat. Roger, just too many unforced errors. Uh, the forehand side alone, I think, was over 20 unforced errors, something like that. I have it on the screen. You'll see that a couple were uh, volley errors, for, I think two forehand volley errors uh, we can think of. Um, I guess they counted that overhead. Oh, this was great. Take a look at this. The, when Roger, it wasn't great when Roger slips, and the commentators at the time said, oh, he just planted his foot on the line, just right to slip on the paint a little. I don't know if that's actually what it was. No one knows for sure. But Roger had that easy overhead in the tiebreaker after he misses the forehand swing volley. Uh, what, what was the other one? He had another easy miss up at the net where you just would never, you know, he looked awkward moving to the ball, a little sluggish, looked very sluggish running out to his right side to get to forehands. You know, we were talking in the last video about how Roger was uh, looking good, moving good because he's hitting cross court forehands, burning his opponent like he used to in the good old days or not quite, but almost not there at all. Looked very slow running defensively to the forehand corner against Hubie at the net, looked a little slow. I'd even heard Tim Henman say uh, in a matches before that, and he said it's probably just because Roger thinks that up at the net it's not worn as much, so it's more slippery still, so he's just being careful. But maybe it was just not that Roger was being careful, but just that the movement at the net, not quite as sharp. Still very good considering his age and everything, but not sharp enough to win Wimbledon, beat someone like Novak Djokovic for sure. All right, uh, let's play some clips for you. This was immediately after the loss. A lot of shock you'll hear here. Uh, Brad Gilbert, Chris Fowler in the booth. Uh, this is Brad Gilbert noticing that Federer looked at his camp when he went down 0-3 in the third set, basically saying, like, it's done. You know, I, I'm physically, I don't have it today. As the sun sets here today, you, you begin to think about Roger's future. And he's in that position where, like Serena Williams, she hates those questions, Venus hates those questions, but they're inevitable at this stage in a career when you suffered a loss like that. As you said, never a straight set loss for Federer since he won his very first Wimbledon title. Yeah, and it, you know, 2000 and 2002, I just kind of had the feeling when I, I told you 3-0, he shot a look a couple of times to his camp and his body just didn't look like it responded today. And I, I just had this feeling, I, you know, listen, I, 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 there, I have no inkling to, to know anything, but I just was wondering if that was his last match that he'll play here. And again, one of many, one of many, uh, you know, retired great tennis players, Brad Gilbert, not as much of a great as, you know, he's not Boris Becker, but he was very good. Uh, one more guy saying, I don't know if this is the last time we'll ever see Roger here. I hope they're all wrong. Uh, Here's another uh, clip from uh, Brad Gilbert shortly after that. After the Manorino match where he struggled, he did in round two, three, and four start to get a lot better. Fed fans started to actually believe, look at the draw, that there was an opportunity to get to the final. But I do think a match like today, you know, where in his mind that was a clunker, but that's when you're almost 40. That all of a sudden, why does that happen? You know, and... That's sometimes you get sore. You wake up and you're not the same. And I think that's the hardest thing to manage when you get older. Like you think everything's right, and all of a sudden you just don't feel right. And I think that's the hardest thing. And I think too that what you talked about. I think that what he doesn't want to do is have to go to each tournament and say this is the last time I'm going to be there, the last Wimbledon, the last U.S. Open. So I do actually think if he if he did pull a surprise or he he could call it a career, and not want to just you know say it at every tournament. Count me in there. Roger looked better, and I thought he was going to be able to make it to the final. He looked better and better, but as uh, Brad Gilbert was saying, once you hit around the age of forty. You think you're good, you feel physically good, and then one day you wake up and suddenly you realize, I'm not. The body's not cooperating, and I don't know why. And uh, as Darren Cahill will point out in the next clips, that makes it hard to keep playing. That makes it really hard to keep going when you don't 
you don't feel like the body's going to cooperate. It takes the fun and the love out of the game. Patrick McEnroe up next saying, uh, I'm not sure if this is the end for Roger, but he looked like, and I had the same feeling, in that third set, it looked like he just wanted to escape. It looked like he was pretty embarrassed. Uh, he, he couldn't believe what was happening to him. Well, a lot of a lot of emotions watching Federer leave the court because you just you're not sure if this is it. I mean, you, you sort of speculate. We're all wondering. I think he'll take some time to think about this, but certainly the, the way he went out in the final set, getting bageled, he just it, it almost didn't look like he wanted to be out there at that point. Like he knew the writing was on the proverbial wall. Hercotch obviously a lot of firepower, played a very mature match, Darren. But, you know, for, you wonder now for Roger, I mean, I wonder if he's willing to pay the price that he needs to, obviously physically, to come back because the movement wasn't there. His ability to run quickly, especially when he had to go wide, was not there. And I think he knew that. I think he felt that, especially after, you know, dropping the second set, which he probably should have won. Um, so if he thinks he can do the work to get back, you know, to get his fitness and get his movement back, I think he'll continue. But I don't think he continues if he thinks that this is the best he can do, the best he can play at this point. If he thinks that the work will actually bring his movement back, he will keep going. If he doesn't believe it, he's not going to keep playing. He doesn't want to show up as a guy who has no chance of winning. He, at the very least, and I, I, did he say that in this clip? And Maybe it's a different clip. Uh, play the next clip. I think it's in the next one. Yeah, if he's not going to get rewarded for the right. work. Because I think he's willing to do the work. He's always mm -hmm. has been willing to do the work. But at 39 years of age, whether or not you get that reward, and it's kind of what Andy Murray's going through as well right at the moment. But, you know, we talk about the why these guys get out of bed and do the training they do. And, and had you even said to me at the start of the tournament, Chris, what would be a good result for Roger coming in here with all the form and the two knee surgeries and everything coming into the tournament? Uh, quarterfinals would mm -hmm. be a, a decent result. So it's kind of where it is at the moment. I guess what's a little bit shocking for all of us was the way it happened right. today. And that second set tiebreaker, I'm not sure that I've seen a worse tiebreak from Roger. It looked a little bit clumsy on a couple of points and shanking the forehand a lot. And then really for his level to come down four or five notches in that final set. Okay, never mind. That was Darren Cahill uh, saying that he's never seen a worse tiebreaker from Roger. And, uh, you know, it is a decent result. Quarterfinals, to, considering everything Roger's gone through to come back, it's pretty good. It's pretty impressive. Just like at the French Open, making it to the fourth round and then pulling the plug. Uh, pretty impressive. But to hear Darren Cahill say Roger looked a little bit clumsy, uh, that's talking about footwork, balance, and to say for his level to come down four to five notches, uh, that's tough to hear. Where was the, the thing? Uh, let's play the next clip. Eventually, we're going to get to the thing I was thinking of. If we don't, we'll just say forget it. But coming into Wimbledon, if you would have told him, Roger, you're going to get to the quarterfinals, don't you think he would have been pleased? I mean, two knee surgeries and eight matches? I think he would have been pleased with that. But I think, again, it was the way this match transpired to me that has me wondering. I think if, as Darren rightly said, coming in, having pulled out of the French Open, having you know played really no competitive tennis for a year and a half, say, okay, you're in the quarters, you're going to lose a tough four setter to a, you know, a young guy like Horkout who's got some game. But to, but to lose it the way he lost it, that to me was what sort of got my mind you know racing and, and obviously roger he's gonna he's gonna digest it he doesn't make rash decisions he's gonna think about it the way he left center court he walked off quickly he didn't do like some huge goodbye you know he wants to at least play at a level that he wants to play at and that to me was not a level that he's going to be comfortable with you know, to, to, to just be in the mix. So he's going to have to evaluate, okay, can I raise my level to where I want it? That doesn't mean he thinks he has to win majors, but at least be at the level where he can compete for them because he wasn't there today. Okay, yeah, that's exactly the clip I was looking for. Roger doesn't have to have the level to win majors, but he has to have the level to, like, compete to win. And I think uh, what he means by that is basically saying, like, you know, Roger wants to know that there's a chance. He's not going to go play these tournaments if it's like, you know, 0%, 10% chance that he wins. You know, he doesn't want to go into these things where everyone watching knows, well, we need a miracle, right? We need we need not only Djokovic, but we need some other young guys who are dangerous to Roger. We need them all to, like, slip and fall and break their ankles for Roger to win the major. Roger's not going to want to do it like that. That's not his style. He's going to want to believe that. Sure, he might have to play his very best at 40, but he wants to know that if he does play his best, he still could beat these guys. And uh, I, I think, 
I think they might decide the team might surprise us all, and we might see Oh Rogers playing the Olympics. I don't know about that. How strict it is. He might skip the Olympics actually, but we might see Roger play some more tournaments going into the U.S. Open. We might see him really, you know, try to get match tough. He said some of that in his own press conference that uh, that might be, you know, what what, what the deal is going to be moving forward. So we shall see. We eagerly await. Uh, let's play this next clip. I just can't imagine Federer not playing Wimbledon again and not saying goodbye without his parents present, without Mirka present, the family. It's such a personal place to him. That was Chris McKendry from ESPN. That's my point. I just don't see Roger retiring without playing one more time. But I will say this. Uh, I do recall Roger saying some years ago that he wouldn't want to do a retirement tour like Agassi. He, he just wouldn't do that. It was a long time ago. People change, right? People change their minds. Their perspectives change, right? You might think 70 sounds like a really old age, but when you're 65, 70, not so bad. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, it could change. So not even really making an effort. I mean, he obviously making an effort, but the explosion in the legs is just not there. It's just, just not there. And there it is. You know, the sixth love, the only time he's been big ever here at Wimbledon. Just crazy. Just not there. That is the one thing I've been saying for years. If I watch clips of Roger practicing, and I think he still has the great movement, he can still beat anyone. If the explosion is not there in the legs, um, it's time to retire. The question for me, obviously, he lost it. I thought he was moving really well. Maybe not 2017. I wanted it, but maybe not. But he's moving very well, considering. And then by the time he got to her catch, was it just the fact that he hadn't had the matches? He hadn't played that many five-set matches in a row? I don't know. I don't know. Can he get the movement back? I think he'll try if he thinks he can do it. If Pierre Paganini says, I've got a great plan for Roger to get the movement back at uh, the best we can get it, and you'll have a chance to win, then I think he does it. And I hope, I certainly hope he does. I'd love to have one more Wimbledon with Roger. Uh, let's listen to... um. Darren Cahill talk about his experiences coaching Agassi to the very end of his career. You know, I spent the last five years with Andre during his career as well, and at 35 years of age, you know, he knew that the toughest thing for him, and he was willing, and he, he would play for another five or six years if he could have, but he knew the toughest thing for him was the recovery. Mm -hmm. His body just wouldn't back it up after playing a four or five set match, and he needed more than two days, which you have at the Grand Slam. So for him, that was the biggest indication. Well, again, and this guy's 39. Yeah, 39. He's turning 40 August day. At 35, you hear it. At 35, Agassi, two days, no longer long enough to recover. All right, you play your match. You get the rest that night. The next day, you got the full 24 hours, day and night to recover. And then the next day, you know, you, you got as much time as you get before your match, you know, depending on if you're playing night session, day session. And then he points out, of course, Roger's not 35. He's 39. You might be moving great, but if you get to a point where you can't play a five-set match or a four-set match without, you know, and, and then move that great again the next time, you know, that, that day in between matches, the two days recovery is not enough, you can't compete anymore. It's that simple. I don't know if we're there with Roger, but uh, I'm afraid we could be. Uh, what else do we got here? There wasn't a pop. You know, yeah. there wasn't a pop in his game. We saw some signs of it at different times during this tournament. Uh, but it wasn't there today. You know, the second serve didn't have the bite. His explosive movement wasn't there. Just the, the, the quick movements that have become, you know, we know that's what Federer does, especially on grass, where you got to move quickly, you got to react aggressively, you got to move forward. None of that was there, particularly once he, you know, had those hiccups in the second set. The fast twitch. Yeah. You know, that quick reaction mm -hmm. stuff as well. Uh, I think that's legs. Second serve didn't have the bite. Explosive movement not there. Obviously, explosive movement is legs related. But second serve, that's another thing. If, it, if you can't get enough on that second serve, it's probably coming from the legs. And, yeah, I mean, the, the numbers for Roger on second serve were horrible in the, the whole match. You know, at least I think Roger won 85% first serve points in the first set against Hubie. But second serve was bad all the way. And first serve dropped to, like, 46 in the third set. Something terrible. Uh, and then finally, I won't play the clip for you. We've done enough clips, I think, now. But uh, Patrick McEnroe says, One of the great things about Roger over the years is that he's made great decisions. He'll go away with his team now. As he said before, he needed to be out of Wimbledon to make a decision about the Olympics. So clearly, that's the way it's going. If he's healthy and fit, he needs to play. He needs some matches. He needs to, He's played so few matches in the last couple of years. Maybe it's a good thing to go to Tokyo and get some matches. If he wants to give himself the best chance at U.S. Open to play a couple lead-in tournaments there, hopefully the body will hold up. I reckon, oh, this is Darren Cahill because he's the only one who says I reckon. 
I reckon the Olympics will give us a good indication of where he is mentally and physically. I don't know if Roger will play the Olympics because, if you haven't heard, they just eliminated all fans. So we're going to be um, residents of Japan playing uh, or watching, spectating. Now, even they're not allowed to go because of COVID restrictions. So um, Olympics, it's going to be very strict with the COVID protocol. I don't know if Roger's going to want to deal with all that. He might want to come to the U.S. where it's definitely a lot more lax. Let me just tell you what Roger said in Swiss German because he's usually a little more candid uh, in the Swiss German. Uh, here we go. This is uh, thanks to Maria on Twitter at RF8R9. She did the translation from Swiss German. That was uh, very nice of Maria. Uh, when you look back on the whole tournament, Marcel says, how do you assess it? What falls for you and what factors are going to play into your decision on how to continue? First, I need time to analyze everything in peace, to hear what everyone has to say, to see if I did better than I expected or worse. How does the journey continue from here? How should the journey go on? I need a little bit of time for this. At the first round here and the hard 18 months personally, I'm happy that I reached the quarter after the tough match of uh, Manorino, he means. So after 18 months of comeback and tedious comeback and Manorino scare, I'm happy that I reached the quarterfinals because there was always the danger that I come to Wimbledon and lose in the first round. And the body doesn't cooperate or, or, or danger that the body doesn't cooperate or the mind doesn't want to doesn't want, I don't know what that, that's part of the translation, I guess, or just the level is not that good. I proved many things to myself here, but in the end, I noticed that something was still missing. And uh, I think that's ultimately the legs just didn't, didn't move right. You know, we just talked about all that stuff. The question is, in what direction to go? Do I work on fitness? Do I have a break? Do I keep playing and try to take advantage of the momentum because I've worked hard to get match fit? For this reason, I need time to analyze everything. And then Renee Stauffer, only a couple Swiss German questions here. He said, I had a feeling your concentration wasn't great. I think this is where Roger talks about the wind being a factor. Hit the music because we're getting out of here after this. There's no German idioms today. Comment below, will I get the German idioms in the final video of Wimbledon this year after uh, after Djokovic beats Berrettini on Sunday? Uh, finally, I'll leave you with this. Rene Stauffer, uh, he loves Fed. He's a Swiss journalist. He's written some books about Roger Federer, I think more than one. He says, I had a feeling your concentration wasn't great. You made some errors that you shouldn't have made. Was this because of wind? It hasn't happened to you to lose 06 here, right? You haven't eat, eaten a bagel at Wimbledon. It's only the second bagel in his career. Can you believe that? The wind played a little bit of a role because in such conditions, my footwork should have been better. That's one of the things that are still missing. Okay, so there he's saying that, he, you know, he's admitting his footwork isn't as good as it was before the knee surgeries. Does he believe he can get there? That's what we'll find out in the coming weeks or however long it takes him for him to announce what his plans are. I can't move as well as I want to time and time again, and especially in defense when it gets complicated against the best players. And of course, if the wind, when it's very windy, you got to do a little extra work on the footwork end to, uh, to, to pull off a great shot. That's what I experienced today. It doesn't happen often to me to be down two sets in a break. In such moments, the opponent rears up. I've also come to know that feeling quite well. I tried everything. I'm happy, happy with what I achieved at this tournament. I wish it went a bit better today, but it wasn't possible. All right. Well, that's it. Did the best I can to make a great show, despite being uh, very, very sad about uh, Roger. Thank you to Elad. Thank you to all the patron saints. Thank you to everyone who comments, especially if you say a nice comment now, because the, the haters always come out after a loss like this. And there's really never been a loss like this for Federer fans. Uh, I don't understand why people want to tear down a, a good thing, you know, but that's something that uh, people do sometimes. So if you're one of the people that uh, had a nice comment down below, I appreciate that because I, I saw plenty of uh, very mean ones trying to rub in, uh, rub it in that Roger lost the way he did, knowing how much I love Roger Federer. We will be back uh, possibly Sunday night. You know how it is. Uh, I don't know if I have a song ready to go this time. Inspiration usually hits me in the two weeks of a major somewhere. We'll see if the inspiration... I had some inspiration uh, for a Chapo song, but he's out, so you don't get a song when you lose. Uh, we'll see. Maybe uh, maybe I'll come up with something and we'll do a show on Monday. Or maybe we'll just move past this year's Wimbledon uh, Sunday night with a shorter video. I don't know yet. But thank you for joining us. Thanks for uh, being a part of this Wimbledon run with me. I still enjoyed it very much. It's been the thrill of my life making these videos for you. And whatever these videos uh, might mean to you, you might, you might really love them. Just know that you being here, making Coffee Break Tennis a thing, because without you watching it, it wouldn't be a thing. Just know that that means a lot more to me. So I thank you for that. See you.